for uh, my uh, last aunt on my mother's side. And uh, she was not a Christian. So there was a lot of folks there that were suffering. And it, it's, just, it's just a sad thing. But nonetheless, uh, that's the way life is. So uh, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to see what the scripture says about these things. Uh, so the introduction says, Do anyone with love and concern for others that God himself has for his preachers will naturally be anxious about the eternal welfare of family and, and their, 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 their friends. Um, last week, we ended the study with someone asking about will we recognize each other in heaven. Remember that last bit of the discussion? Um, someone even said, well, what, what about those that, um, uh, if, if I'm in paradise, will I know where my loved ones are? Will I be aware of uh, that they make, if they didn't make it to heaven, what kind of paradise will that be? Well, there are some things that we don't know and other things that we do know because uh, the, uh, uh, the, the scripture tells us. So let's just see what the scripture does, does tell us. And let's begin <clears throat> by reading um, the first verse in this outline uh, is Luke chapter 16. And that is uh, the rich man and Lazarus. So as we get there, uh, you know, death, whether it's a Christian or not, is very, very traumatic. And it depends how traumatic it's going to be, depends uh, uh, how much suffering that loved one is, uh, has been experiencing, depends how uh, traumatic the death was, if it was expected, unexpected, if the loved one uh, was old. If the disease had been long, um, it, it all depends, but it's still traumatic. And funerals are not for the dead. What are funerals for? For the living. That, that is true. Funerals are for the living. Uh, so at funerals, um, it's very rare that you'll hear anyone, whether it's the preacher or, or the, or the family, very rare for you to hear them say, well, that person in the coffin was a dirty, rotten scoundrel, or that person in the coffin, uh, is more than likely in hell because, and then they say how bad that person lived. Usually the preacher preaches the dead person into heaven. Right. Uh, and why do you think we do that often? I, I, I don't preach him into heaven or into hell, but why do you think we do that often? Because that's what people want to hear. <laughs> yeah, that's what people want to hear. Um, well, it makes people feel better. Dave, what, what were you going to say? And, and it would make us a judge. And we don't, we, we can't judge. God will do what he wants. But According to his word, we can pretty much summarize where they're at. Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, I think you're, you're right. We we do become the judge. Um, if you look at, at John chapter, let's go to John chapter eight before we read in Luke. John chapter eight, um, and and John eight is fresh on my mind because I'm going to be preaching from from there, uh, verse twelve, and Jesus is talking about him being the light and in verse 13 he says so the pharisee said to him you are testifying about yourself your testimony is not true and jesus answered and said to them even if i testify about myself my testimony is true for i know where i came from and where i am going but you do not know where i come from or where i'm going now look at verse 15 about judging you judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. Now, Jesus isn't saying that he doesn't judge. But in, in, in that argument or in that conversation, he says, there's no need for me to judge. And then he gives him a reason because of the law and the testimony of two or three witnesses. But what I'm concerned about is verse 15. You judge according to the flesh. And that's what we often do. We don't know 
the eternal destiny of the person who dies. No matter how well they lived or, or how devout we think, uh, because the only one that really knows the heart of a person are two beings, the one that, that, that's living or the one that died, and God. That's the only two people that we know or that, that knows how well they live, that knows their heart. So in this uh, outline, there are two questions. Uh, one is, uh, let me move this up, is what are two coping mechanisms that people often uh, say or give themselves or, or hear uh, to make them feel better, but often misses the point? See, these two things will only people say about their loved one in order to cope with their death and how this perspective often misses a point. I think we said one, you know, they they assume or judge according to the flesh that uh, the loved one or that friend uh, has gone to heaven. What was the question? <laughs> number one, the last sentence of number one, list two things worldly people say about their loved one in order to cope with their death and how this perspective often misses the point. Now, another one that I've heard is, well, they're no longer suffering. Or they're in a better place. And, you know, I, I learned from a, from a good friend there in Indiana, uh, uh, John Fisher, that he uh, his response is, well, that's a very comforting thought because you really don't want to destroy at that moment. That's not the place to say, well, no, he's probably in hell <laughs> <laughs> or he's not suffering here. You're right, but he's suffering in hell if he went to hell. That's not really the moment to say things like that, but it is a comforting thought. Uh, so I would say for me, I would list one. Um, they're not suffering anymore. Physically. Physically, that is true, Brother Dave. And then the second one for me would be the one that I often hear is uh, God needed another angel. And that, that supposes or that assumes that when babies die or children die, they, they turn into angels. But nowhere in the scriptures do we read that, do we? And maybe it's because there's some little fat cherubs. Yeah. And people just assume that that's what a baby turns into. Well, we know they're sinless. Yeah. But, you know, th those are the two that I most often hear. When one when it's for, for a child, God needed another angel. Or, or for an adult, um, God no longer needed, a, needed him here. He had different plans for him in heaven. Well... What other plans does God have for us in heaven? Uh, or, or another one that say um, his work here was done. He's really, really a good guy. Oh, he's, yeah, he was really, really a good guy. Yeah, or a person. Uh, and then number two, it goes along the same lines. Um, what... Uh, some well-meaning but misplaced answers. Letter A, you shouldn't worry about that. Now, why would that be misguided? You shouldn't be worried about where that person is. Now, I don't agree with the last part. Why is this misguided? I, I think that I should be worried where the eternal destiny of that person is, or maybe I shouldn't, but let's discuss it. So, well, so you well meaning, but misplaced you answers. You shouldn't about worry that. about that. <laughs> okay, say that again, Dave. I said the reason you don't have to worry about it is because there's nothing you can do to change it now. They're dead. Okay, so we can't change where they went or where they are because we can't change it. That is that is true. Anyone else? It's under God's, it's under God's control. Okay, so God, God is the one that, that decides that it's under his control. Anyone else? He knows heart. God knows her heart. So the, the reason I say that 
that this this the way this question is worded is I don't necessarily agree with it completely is because one I shouldn't be worried about where they are now but I should be worried or I'm headed and funerals is the best time to preach the gospel when my grandmother passed away I had a, a cousin of mine that was no longer faithful and she came up to me and she said now we thought long and hard about you preaching this funeral for our grandmother, which I thought I was going to do it anyway, whether she liked it or not. But she said, and I'm asking, don't get up there and start talking about heaven and hell and obey the gospel. It's not the place where we just want you to say some really nice things about grandma. And I said a lot of nice things about grandma. And I said what I say in every funeral. This loved one of ours, whether she is in paradise, which I got it, or in torment, it doesn't matter where she is, but wherever she is, she would love, just like the rich man, for someone to come down to earth and tell you what you must do in order to get to paradise. And that person is me. And I preach the gospel. Every funeral, I do the same thing. That's great. So letter B under two, you won't think about that in heaven. You won't think about your loved one, whether they went, where they went, you won't, because it's just be eternal bliss. Now, what's wrong with that answer? So, so you, you, you come to me because you're suffering about, I don't know, your, your brother that, that died and, and you're really concerned about the way he lived. Uh, and you say, I, I, I'm really afraid that he might be suffering in eternity now. And I say to you, well, listen, you want to think about that while you're alive. You're going to suffer with that doubt while you're alive. But when, when you go to heaven, you won't even worry about that anymore. So why, why do you think that's a misguided or, or what's wrong with that answer? You haven't said much, at least. I got a question about it. <laughs> What's that, Dave? I said I have a question about it. I guess we're we're making some assumptions here. Yeah. We're, we're assuming that we will recognize other people that have been in our lives when we are there. We don't know that. Uh, how how can uh, you have eternal bliss or, or eternal happiness if you're worried about somebody who is not where you are? Uh, I, I don't know. I have a feeling that we won't know where everybody is. Okay. So if could be wrong. Yeah. If a uh, heaven, if um, if Luke sixteen is an indication of what heaven's going to be like, you know, rich man and Lazarus, then then we will recognize have some type of recognition of each other. But I don't know uh, if if. Paradise and torment is an indication of what heaven's going to be like. Yes, sir. I've heard it said, and this, this is something else to think about is you will know each other, you will know who isn't there, but you'll have such a, uh, a such an understanding of what God's will is and what is required, and that they had the opportunity and, and gave it up. That I don't know how to finish the statement that it's like you're not that you're okay with it but you, you just understand the opportunity was there and they let it go um maybe that's just to make you feel better yeah but, uh, well this last one here well let me let me give you my perspective on you won't think about that in heaven what's wrong with this answer is that what's wrong with this answer is that i i fear that we might we may lose a sense of urgency to talk to the rest of our family about the gospel. That applies to A2. Yeah, it, it, actually, it applies to all of them, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, it, it, yeah, that, that would be the reason for me to say that this is probably not the right answer to give. Uh, and then let her see. God, in the end, God may make an exception for your loved one. 
there's a scripture that teaches that God is not going to make an exception. Now, if I was in control, like I said Sunday evening on our uh, during the lesson about um, who who um, asking for a friend, if I was in control of of heaven, earth, if I was God, I probably would say, you know what? Uh, I know I had all these rules, all these terms and conditions, but ah, throw those things out. Let's everybody come to heaven. Even a Charles Manson, come on into heaven. We'll reform you here. But there's a passage that tells us that God will not do that. There's actually two. Anybody want to take a stab at why God is not going to make an exception for anyone? I don't remember. He said God's unchangeable. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember the location of it, but there's the verse that says he's not a respecter of persons. Yes, God is not a respecter of persons. Uh, when he was preaching uh, in, uh, in Athens uh, at the uh, Arapagai, God commands everyone everywhere to repent, right? Everyone everywhere. He no longer is a respecter of persons. So that is that's the passage I was thinking of. And then the one brother Dave said that it is impossible for God to do two things. One, he cannot lie. And two, there is no variation. He won't change. He will not change his plan. So did you find the passage? Acts 10. 34. Acts 10. Acts 10, 34 says, and Peter opened his mouth and said, the truth I perceive that God is no, no respecter of persons. Acts 10, 34. And every nation, he that fears him, towards righteousness, etc. Okay, and then are you able to find the one that Brother Dave mentioned, that it is impossible for God to lie? That's in Hebrews, I believe. Uh, 6.18. Hebrews 6 and verse 18. Would you read that, please? Uh, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, he might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. And uh, was that just 18? Read 19 too, please. Uh, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. All right, so we have an anchor that is sure and steadfast, which is our hope. And, and our anchor is anchored in heaven. And the day that God lies, or the day that God changed his purpose or his plan, then is the day that we no longer can have a sure and secure anchor. Because then we'll, we won't know what he's going to change. What's going to remain constant? It'd be like playing games with children, like uh, moving the goalposts. Number three, rational answers, which don't always help a very emotional issue. So this is when, right at the funeral, or right when someone's dead, and, and I made this mistake a couple of times uh, at very beginning of my preaching uh, career. And I recognized it and I apologized, but once words come out of your mouth, it's hard to make a correction. So these are rational answers, but they don't always help. So here's one example of a mistake I made. So here, a, uh, a lady lost her sister to alcoholism and everyone that knew her knew that she was an alcoholic and it was a bad thing, a lot of suffering. And uh, I was there at the funeral and she looks at me for comfort. And I said, well, sister, let's just make sure that her death is not in vain. What I meant by that was you still have a brother that's alive and he's an alcoholic. So let's use your sister's death to alcoholism to try to get him to change. Well, I still think it's a rational answer, but it's a wrong moment, the wrong time. And still probably should have never said it, even to this day. Yeah, but I apologized once I, once I thought about it, and she said, yes, it hurt me very much. 
So here's a, another rational answer, which doesn't always help. God doesn't owe anyone salvation. It's by the grace based upon condition. Was well, that true? Yeah. So, so you're standing there over, over at the coffin looking at your dead loved one or the body of your dead loved one. And someone comes up and says this to you. Not comforting, is it? Or you've gone for about six weeks of mourning and crying and just having a hard time dealing with the departure of your loved one. And someone comes to you and says, listen, you're, 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 you're destroying yourself. What's to be gained by that? Get out and live and travel and just enjoy yourself. Well, that's rational. But nobody knows how much you're experiencing during your grief because we all grieve in different ways. There are some folks that you look at them and you wonder, how in the world is that person able to be so cold because she or he didn't show any emotion, has not shown any emotion. Or man, that man is a mess. You see how much he blubbered over there, you know, and cried and cried and passed out. They had to call a neck. We all do things, go through things differently. So these are things that we probably shouldn't say, whether they're true or not. So let's look at some other potential approaches uh, and look at some scriptures. That's number four. <clears throat> Let's read Luke 16, verses 27 through 28. Luke 16, verses 27 through 28. All right, Sister Robbins, would you like to read that, please? 27 through 28? Yes. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So what was the rich man's desire? Which I've mentioned earlier. What was the rich man's desire? His brothers to heaven. Yeah, he wanted, his brothers. he wanted his brothers to go to heaven because they lived just as riotous, or rather just as, uh, as a, an exaggerated, splendid life as he did. And he asked Father Abraham to do something about that. What was it? Yeah. Through whom? To send Lazarus, right? Yep. Lazarus. You have to read a few more verses, but yeah, he said Lazarus. Then Abraham says that they won't believe. They've got Moses and the prophets, which means they've got the law. They've got the Bible. They've got preachers. They've got all these things, all these people and things. And if your brothers won't believe that, then they won't believe someone coming back from the dead. Now, I'm not saying that this is what we say to people. It's specifically just like I read there. But is there an advantage in taking a similar approach or a disadvantage? Somewhat of an advantage, but I've, I've seen and studied with people in my past that they have been so with the Pope and the priests and the nuns and the uh, it's just been their their doctrine, everything since they were babies have been pounded into their heads that they wouldn't dare make a move without the Pope saying, Yeah, and they would think that they were if they did follow what the Bible said. And, and went this way that they would go to hell because of what the Pope says. I mean, it's just like pounded right into them. And what are you going to do? They just, oh, I can't, you know, I believe everything you taught me, but I'll, I'll wait until the Pope says it's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wait a minute. Let's start over here where, where we read about the Pope not being the, the authority, but there's fear 
in some people that it's a change. Yeah. So it's, you know, this part too is if, if you have somebody come to them, are they going to believe, you know, no matter. And they may, but at least it's an open opportunity. Might, right. Because that's one of the most sensitive. Yeah. All right, letter B. None of us can make choices for others. How, how does free will come into play uh, with this answer? That's it's up to each individual person. You can't force them to obey. Because how does free will come into play? That person has free will. You, um, you just have to, in some cases, you just keep working on them, keep showing them the truth and living it. And um, just, I had a friend that it was 20 years later, he thought, you know, when he'd ask me things, I just, I just give him the answer, give him the verses to think about. It's up to him. It took him 20 years, but he still believed. Remember the parable uh, that Jesus told us that he needed uh, this, this landowner needed some work, a, a worker. So he went out where the workers hung out, found one, made a deal of how much he was going to pay him early in the morning. So he takes them out around noon. He thinks, well, I think I need another worker. So he goes and finds another one, makes a deal with them and brings them to the farm. Later on that day, towards the end of the day, he says, I think I need another one. So he goes and hires that third one and comes at the end of the day to pay. He begins with the last one and he pays them the same amount that he had negotiated with the first one so the first one's thinking wow if he paid him let's say 50 bucks and he only worked for an hour or two that means he's going to pay me a lot more and the second one that he hired he pays him the same and then when he gets to the first one he pays him the same he says wait a sec i worked a lot longer than they all did and you don't, you're paying me the same as the guy that only worked an hour or two and the landowner says did we not make this deal and you agreed to it? He said, yeah. Then don't worry about how much or how little the other one gets. So the point of that parable is it takes you 20 years or 30 years and you're 95, sick, in your deathbed and you decide you want to obey the gospel. And the guy that's been serving God for 70 years comes to the end of his life. We should be as happy and as jubilous as the one who served 70 years, as the one that served two days and died, yeah. right? Well, yeah, he made the end, is making it to the end. And some journeys are longer than the others. So none of us can make choices for others. But what we can do is help them, guide them into making the right choice through love and patience and, and teach them what is the truth. Uh, because again, free will is indeed uh, something that God has given all of us. We're not, God didn't arbitrarily choose even before we were born who was going to heaven, who was going to hell. If he did that, then why even tell us to do right and not do wrong? Why would he tell us or command us to live a faithful life if he's already decided that who's going to do right and who's going to do wrong? That's just like playing a game like a schoolyard bully with a magnifying glass burning ants. Why? Red. Yes, sir. It reminds me of a saying that I hear all the time. It says, we're free to make any decisions we want, but we're not free from the consequences of them. That is true. That is true. Um, I think a scientist said that, right? Every action has an equal reaction or something like that. Mm -hmm. Another uh, answer or thought, it is beyond our ability to render judgment in specific cases. How do we balance the clear teaching of scripture against human inability to judge perfectly? Now, I, is it true that it's beyond our ability to render judgment in specific cases? Or can we render good or perfect judgment in every case? No. Tell people we, can, we can render judgment, but not according to our standards. Yeah, that's why John 8, 15 was there. You judge according to the flesh. 
I would say you can't judge. You have to judge, and we are judging. You can't judge because I can't judge his heart. I I can judge because I we have to judge others as far as like if someone's a heretic, their actions, have, their actions, their actions. Yep. And then we are judging right now because God says if you can follow the scriptures and be um, a good Christian, then that means everybody else on the planet can too. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of. We're kind of judging them by our actions. Yeah. And then letter D. God's judgments are always right. Where's the focus in this answer? God's judgments are always right. Always on the down side. Yeah. So I think the focus is on always and also on right. God. Yeah, the whole thing. yeah uh, I would. Because my judgment is flawed. And I judge based on my emotions or limited knowledge or what I want. But God's judgment is fair. It's righteous. That's letter D. Right above the conclusion. Yeah. Can't think of the verse where it says the guy's actually asking God not to, you know, not. Don't judge me righteously because I'm trying to think how it's. Oh, going. yeah. Don't give me what I deserve. Yeah. Don't give me what I deserve. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. Grace and mercy. That what we all say. <laughs> yeah. Grace and mercy. We'll take. Yeah. Let's see if I can find that quickly. I think uh, it'd be mercy is what I say, uh, seek and not what I deserve. Uh, but let's try let's try Isaiah 3 10 through 12. Uh, if that's not it, I, uh, Psalm 103 8 through 10. Sister Robbins, would you look up, um, rather, uh, Rachel, would you look up Psalm 103? Psalm 103 verses 8 through 10. And then somebody else looked up uh, Isaiah 3 10 through 12. Isaiah what? No, you, you look up Psalm 103, Psalm 8 through 10. 103. Yes, ma'am. Start where? 8, eight. through 10. Are you there? Yeah. Go ahead and read it, please. The Lord, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Kindness. He will not always strive with us, but will he keep his anger forever? He has not dealt with us according to our sins, yeah. nor rewarded us according to our iniquity. So there the psalmist says that he will not fight or argue or strive, wrestle with us forever. But there'll come a time that you know judgment will be rendered. Now he says. Right now, he's not treated us according to our iniquities, but according to what? Mercy? That's uh, verse 10. All right. So what does Isaiah say? Who has that? That's Isaiah 3, 10 through 12. Say to the righteous that it shall be well with them. For they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. As for my people, <clears throat> children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they who lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Mm. Yeah, that's not the one that I uh, thought. But it does say that they'll eat the fruit of their doings, so they're. <laughs> Uh, the sin has, or the their decisions has consequences. All right. Uh, I, I think that the closest one there is Psalm 103 and verses 8 through 10. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Uh, he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. Uh, so thank God that I don't get what I deserve. People clamoring to get what they deserve uh, are really in the dark. 
and they're going to be happy. <laughs> I mean, yes, sir. Even even when we stand before the judgment seat of God, I, I, I we should. I mean, I don't want to say give me what I deserve. That that's what a a person who believes that you work in order to get to heaven. They should ask for grace, mercy, forgiveness, love, and all those good things. Did you have something? Yeah, kind of lost it now. But uh, is he talking about in the end or on earth? Because, uh, um, Psalm 103? Yeah, um, verse 9. Uh, Psalm 103, verse 9. Is he talking about while we are alive or while we are dead? He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins. Well, I mean, there will come a time where he's, where, where that's going to stop, where he, uh, or we will be judged according to what we've done. And there will be no more sin. So a direct answer is both while we are alive and while we are dead. And then when we, when we die. Letter E, we must want to please God more than anyone or anything else. Is that something that is true? Yeah. Yeah. And, and and how would this comfort someone who's lost a family member or a friend? Right, spiritually minded, probably not much. Yeah. <laughs> but afterwards, after they've grieved and you know made some progress, uh, this is something we could start with a, a little bit of counseling. You know, I've, I've heard people here in Wapaka, especially uh, very Lutheran-minded folks, say to me, you know, what, what, what you are teaching me, what you're reading from the Bible to me, it makes sense. But I can't leave the faith of my mother and father because they died this way. And if I make changes, I'm condemning them to hell, and I'm, I'm not going to do that. Well... Do we want to please them or do we want to please God? And for some people in their minds, they think, they're not right, but they think that if mom and dad are in hell, that's where they want to be. Doesn't Ezekiel 20 talk about the man is not guilty of his father's sins or vice versa? Yes, uh, yes, sour grapes. But you know, setting their teeth on edge, however... When people say this, that if their loved one, loved one is in hell, that's where they want to be, they don't have an understanding, a proper understanding of what hell is like. Boy, and, and, neither do I, and, neither, and neither do I, other than you know, what I've read in the scriptures, but even then, it doesn't give us the full effect of what hell is like. But enough that you don't want to go there. But it's enough that, yes, we don't want to go there. There's a lot of people that say that when you try to teach them, you know, my mother and father, you know, they want to not um, make him feel bad to change. Well, he said it perfectly. I can't say well, that's it. That's why you bring up. Well, but a lot of people say that. Well, I was in the rich man. You know, I can't. Yeah, go against my father and mother. That was the example given that. Um, oh well, if, if uh, you know if they're if they're in hell, I don't want to go to heaven without them. But you know, Lazarus or the rich man, yeah. he didn't want him there with him. No, he's like, no, no, don't don't follow me. Let's look at Romans nine. I think Paul uh, gives us a, even a better example. Romans nine verse one. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So now Paul here is, is saying, if, if there is a way that I could save all of my Jewish brethren, all of my blood family, uh, talking about the, the Jewish race. 
And if that meant that I, I would be cursed, suffer eternal hell, and that meant that me exchanging my salvation for theirs, if that worked, I would do that. I would be willing to do that. So much love there. He didn't have this love for one person. He had it for the entire Jewish race. And it reminds me sort of of what many mothers have said when their little baby is sick, colic or fever or is diagnosed with a terminal disease. And mom says, if I could, if I could trade places with my kid, I would. We're in chapter 10 and the first three verses. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. This is the Jews. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about, about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So then you go back to Romans 9, let's read that again, verses 1, 2, and 3. I am telling you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. See, in Acts 23 and verse 12, his kinsmen, his own people, vowed to kill Paul. But Paul loved them when he says, verse 2, that I have great sorrow and unceasing Grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were a curse separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple servants and the promises. That was what? No, uh, well, I, I said that Acts 23, verse 12, is where the Jews, his kinsmen, vowed to kill him. But yet Paul felt so much love for them that he says, if I, if, if I could be separated from Christ, accursed, for them to be saved, I, I would do that. But that was Acts 23, verse 12, where they said that they would kill him, that they would kill Paul. All right, so let's look at question number one under the conclusion. What did Paul feel in his heart regarding his lost Jewish brethren? So that's, uh, that's Romans 9, verse, verse 2. Go ahead. What? Sorrow. Sorrow, right? He felt, what kind of sorrow? How much sorrow? Uh, great heaviness, continual. Yeah, you're reading uh, NIV? Uh, King, James. King James. Great heaviness, continual sorrow. Unceasing grief. Unceasing grief is another translation. So in verse one, he says, I am not lying. I'm telling the truth in Christ. This is how he truly felt for, for his kinsmen, for his bro brothers. Now, when we compare this to Matthew 23, verses 37 to 38, where Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I wanted to gather you as a chicken gathers her brood underneath her, her wings, but you would not have it. So how did Jesus feel about the city of Jerusalem, which had continually rejected God throughout all the centuries when the Jews said, if we were alive when our fathers were alive and they murdered all these prophets, we, we, would, we would not do what our fathers did. So how did Jesus feel about the city of Jerusalem who had rejected God's law and God's love and God's grace for centuries? Did Jesus hate them or love them? He loved them. Or did he just brood over them like mother over little chicks? Yeah. Cover them up, keep them warm, keep them safe. Feed them. So here is the city of Jerusalem and the people that this city belonged to, the Jews, that had this seething desire to murder him and ended up murdering him. But Jesus loved him. And the same thing with Paul. His kingdom, he had this 
unceasing, unceasing rather, continual heavy sorrow, love for them. Acts 23. They wanted him dead. They beat him. They left him for dead. They chased him. Shouldn't we have that love for everyone, especially our enemies? That Paul did everything in his power, as Christ did, to save the lost. Because 2 Peter 4.14, Paul teaches us that it's not up to me to punish those who punish me but that the judgment and the repaying evil for evil is God's job. What does that say, Lisa? Second Timothy. Oh, not Peter. Second Timothy 4 and 14. Now, I might have said Peter, but you know, I get my, my apostles mixed up. Timothy what? 4, 14. Oh, it's right there. 414? Oh, right. Yes. It says Alexander the coppersmith did much evil. Uh, yes. Probably read that. Yes. 2 Timothy 414 is where Alexander the coppersmith uh, mistreated Paul. Yeah. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Yeah. So Paul doesn't curse Alexander the coppersmith who did him much harm, but he says the Lord will do what? The Lord, the Lord will repay him according to his works. That is true. Yes. Um, when we are experiencing a strong emotional blow, like the death of a loved one, or maybe even anger, how do these strong emotions tend to affect our reasoning skills? Now, we, we're, we're, we usually hear that when our spouse dies, that there are certain things that we probably shouldn't do. Make a big purchase, sell our house, make a big move. Why? Because we're not going straight. What was that? We're not thinking straight. Yeah. yeah. We're not thinking straight. It's, it's based on emotions. Um, unscrupulous salesmen uh, tend to make phone calls or visits. Home buyers, real estate people that are unscrupulous tend to prey on widows and widowers, uh, especially if they know that there's an estate. And we shouldn't make so strong emotions tend to affect our reasoning skills. And we need time to to set things right, to think straight. So in, in, in all of these things that we've looked at and that we talked about, I, I think that the point is is that if my loved one dies, lost, at least if I think that they, lie, they died lost, I need to accept that the ultimate judge is God, that my worry should be, yes, uh, that wherever they are, they have this strong desire for, for me to make sure that I am obeying God and doing what he wants me to do to make sure I get to heaven. And that I should have a strong, continuous love, passionate desire to help others get to heaven. And when I am going to comfort someone who has lost a loved one, that I should be wise and selective in the things that I say so that they can be uplifting and encouraging and not destroying or destructive rather. The last question is a true and false. That's number eight. Jesus experienced unbelief even in his own immediate family when they didn't believe in him. 
I'm, I mean, I'm adding that last part. Or, no, that's not true. Jesus experienced unbelief even in his own immediate family. Yeah, even in his own, even in his own immediate family. That's true. I mean, that's the true statement that I'm making. Whether it's true or false, we have to figure it out. Did Jesus experience unbelief? Mm -hmm. so where do we find that in the Bible? In the Gospels. In the Gospels. <laughs> in the Bible. It's... Exactly. That's oh, what I fun hear. Part. Let's break the passage. Yeah. That's what I hear from those folks that knock on doors trying to sell me religion and pamphlets. Hey, oh, it's in there. I'll get back with you. I got to go and talk to my elder. I narrowed it down. <laughs> Four books. So Four books. It's in, isn't it Matthew 13? Well, what does it say? Um, well, maybe not. <laughs> it talks about the questioning him. Isn't this the carpenter's son? No, his own family. Mark, uh, let's try Mark 6, 4 through 13. So, country in. What's that say? Uh, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. So we can do no mighty work there. So I read 4 through 13. Oh, 4 through 13. Okay. Um, uh, starting verse 5 then. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the village teaching. And he called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. And commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no script, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. All right now, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 21. Still in Mark? Yes. Mark 3, 21. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, he is beside himself. And they took custody of him. All right, so that version says when his friends heard about it, and the other translation says when his family heard about it, or loved ones. But the question is, Jesus experienced unbelief even in his own immediate family. Is that true? Yeah. Remember his brothers and sisters didn't believe, and they told him, why don't you just go on and, and do some miracles? Where's that verse? That's oh, that's, that's, that's the verse you're looking for. Okay. That's the verse I'm thinking of. All right. Oh, well, I'll give it to you right quickly here. It's in the Gospels. <laughs> <laughs> John 7, 5. John 7, 5. Go ahead and read that for us, please, Lisa. For neither did his brethren believe in him. I thought there was another verse that mentioned a couple of them. Well, John 7, let's look at John 7. Uh, no, that's, that's what I have here. Yeah, John, John 7, 5. For not even his brothers were believing in him. There is another one. Read verse 4 also, Ed. What is it? Verse 4. Where no one does anything in secret... 
when he seeks, when he himself seeks to be known publicly, if you do these things, you uh, show yourself to the Lord. Yeah. So that his brothers were saying that to him. Um, so let's look at verse three. Therefore, his brothers said to him, leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples also may see your works, which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. So if you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers were believing in him. And Jesus says, look, my time is not yet come, but your time is always opportunity. So, yeah, that that's... Uh, so the answer to number eight is true, and it is John 7, 3 through 5. All right, uh, let me see. Zoomland folks, any questions or comments? Let me see. Uh, Sister Barry, Mr. Ryans, any comments? Questions? No, I'm not right. so far. Okay. Thank you for the class. Yes, Sister Ryan's. Thank you for being here, and uh, I'm hoping for a great season from the Texans. So am I. <laughs> yes, I know you are. You, uh, you got a good boy there, Enrico. So I, I hope everything goes great. Y'all be Thank blessed. You. you be blessed, and Lord willing, we'll be here next Friday. All righty. Thank you. Have a good one, everybody.